Greetings, I'm Paul Kosakowski, the main developer of the Replicant project. It is a great pleasure for me to introduce Replicant during this workshop on free mobile platforms organized by the International Center for Free and Open Source Software. Replicant is a fully free Android version running on several devices such as this tablet or this phone. It means that Replicant is a fully ethical system in the sense that it respects the uh, user's four basic freedom. Mainly, the freedom to run the program for any purpose, to study how it works, to change it and to help your community by redistributing the software with or without any changes. So, uh, in order to fully comprehend what's at stake regarding freedom on uh, mobile devices, let's first take a look at this device's architecture. So we can simplify a mobile device uh, the following way. First we have the modem, which is the component in charge of interacting with the uh, telephony network, the mobile telephony network. Um, it is um, usually connected to the system on a chip, which is the main processor of the device. That's usually uh, what runs the uh, big operating system. So uh, this uh, system on a chip uh, is actually a uh, CPU with um, some other uh, chips around it. And uh, it's also usually connected to the uh, RAM, the uh, random access memory, uh, to storage as well as other integrated circuits and uh, the um, user I.O. Um, circuits as well. So this is a hardware side representation. Um, we can also look at a, um, a software side representation of uh, mobile devices. So um, at the very beginning, we have the bootloader, which is the uh, the first software that is executed at uh, boot. So uh, it's in charge of uh, bringing up the hardware, setting up um, everything that needs to be um, to be set up uh, when the device starts. Um, after a short uh, period of time, it will um, load and run the kernel, which is uh, the Linux kernel. So uh, at this point, the uh, operating system started. Uh, usually, we have uh, hardware abstraction libraries uh, that interact with the kernel. So uh, these uh, libraries hold uh, the various ways of uh, interpreting the, um, the information from uh, the hardware. So they uh, use the kernel to communicate with the hardware and um, basically report back uh, the information to the Android framework that contains all the APIs that the applications can use to um, communicate with the hardware. So uh, these applications are on the very top uh, of the uh, operating system. So uh, we also have uh, on the modem a, uh, an operating system that's running on its own. Uh, it's a non-free uh, system. But um, we also have integrated circuits that run their own very small programs, which are firmers. They are not um, too complex. They're usually uh, very small. So considering the uh, very best case scenario, the ideal mobile device, well, that would be uh, that would be a device that complies with the following points. Uh, first, it would have to be free hardware. Uh, that means that uh, one could access all the schematics of uh, of the hardware. One could uh, modify it and uh, create a new version of the hardware, either modified or not, but one that would match the uh, schematics. Um, then we would also need free farmers because, uh, well, that's uh, software that's running inside the, the chips and uh, it should be free as well. Uh, regarding the modem, uh, it should also have a, uh, a free operating system that we would have control over. And of course, the, um, the main processor should have uh, a uh, free bootloader and a free system so that we can have control over it as well. Well, having a mobile device that's completely under our control wouldn't quite be enough to achieve um, security, for instance, in uh, communications. Um, for that, we would also need uh, guarantees from the mobile telephony operators. 
First of all, the uh, access to the internet provided uh, through mobile telephony operators should be neutral and it should also make it possible for you to um, to emit information, to host a server and things like that, just as well as you can uh, consult uh, services. We don't want uh, to have only a client access, a read-only access to the internet. What's also very important is that the data should not be uh, intercepted. It should not uh, record the informations you're sending over over that uh, network. That will, should also be the case for um, the phone calls and the uh, short messages that one sends. Um, another very important point is uh, the collection of uh, users' positions, which is something uh, network operators can do. Uh, technically, uh, they have every uh, everything um, they need to do that, and it was established that in uh, many cases they do it. They actually collect the uh, positions of the, the users in real time, and uh, that's really problematic for privacy. So if we look at the uh, actual situation that we have today, well, it is far from ideal. First of all, considering firmwares, well, uh, nearly all the firmwares in integrated circuits are proprietary. Um, it's not even always possible to replace these firmwares. Um, sometimes the uh, firmwares are pre-installed on the chips at uh, factory time and then it's not even possible to change them. Uh, thus, these uh, firmware, which is software, they appear like hardware to us because we cannot change it anymore and it's, uh, it's set in stone. What they do is set in stone and there is no hope for ever replacing that code with uh, free software. The, the the fact that very few uh, free farmers exist is because well they're hard to write and they uh they demand very specific documentation to uh to be written but some free farmers uh, do exist usually for very specific hardware that is hardware that was developed with uh, the intent of uh, making free farmers possible for instance uh the uh, very famous Arduino platform was uh, developed that way. Um, you also have other examples such as the Bus Pirate or the Milk Chemist one. Sometimes we also get lucky and uh, the firmware get liberated by the manufacturer of the hardware itself, but that's very rare. One of uh, the recent occurrences of this well, actually, the most recent one is the ATH9K HTC, which is a Wi-Fi chipset, which was liberated by uh, Qualcomm, and it now can run a fully free uh, firmware. Okay, now taking a look at the modem system. Well, there is a uh, free GSM stack, which is a, a free uh, free software for mobile processors. It is called Osmocom BB. But the uh, only supported devices are very old. For instance, it, the uh, Motorola C123. Uh, uh, it's very old hardware. So uh, the other very, uh, very uh, problematic uh, fact with Osmocom BB is that currently it needs a host computer to operate because uh, Osmocom BB itself is just the um, GSM related software, uh, but it's not quite uh, an operating system so it cannot run on its own on the device it has to rely on uh, some other um, some other system which is uh, a host computer so that that means that in order to use a phone with Osmo BB you need to have a, a laptop around so it's not it's not really usable yet but then there are also some uh, issues with the uh, software certification and public networks because running a free software GSM stack uh, on public networks uh, would involve at some point certification which which can be uh, done but might also be problematic. So currently Osmocom BB is developed in uh, test conditions and uh, should not yet be used on public networks. However, the uh, modem is one of the most important part that we want to look at when considering security on a um, on a phone. 
because the the modem is uh, actually nearly always connected to uh, the GSM network and since it's um, most of the time running proprietary software uh, it can be uh, remotely controlled the uh, GSM operator can remotely send a uh, commands to the modem and can potentially order it to uh, do bad things and actually uh, there were a few examples of uh, phones being turned into uh, remote listening devices um, because uh, well the uh, this software running inside of the modem allowed it and um, that's really uh, even more problematic when the uh, modem can access the hardware for instance, if the modem can uh, reach the camera, then uh, the uh, the network operator can uh, tell the modem to uh, well take a picture, and uh, that way it's it can very e efficiently spy on you. And the same goes for, for instance, the microphone or the GPS chip, uh, which would allow the operator to uh, access a an even more precise uh, position of the uh, target. So this is why we uh, consider modem isolation. In that case we have uh, a very bad modem isolation because the modem is not only connected to the system on a chip but also to uh, other devices such as memory, storage or GPS, codec camera and user I.O. All that means that in that position is able to spy on the user in very efficient way. For instance, if it's connected to storage, it can um, access the uh, user's files if they're not encrypted. So that's uh, a very, uh, very bad thing that we really want to avoid. The 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 way to avoid it is to um, use good modem isolation, where the modem is only connected to the system on a chip and not to anything else not to the RAM, the storage or GPS, to not to the um, microphone, not nor the camera. Well, nor anything else it doesn't really have any reason to be connected to. Okay, so taking a look on the applications processor now. Starting with uh, the bootloaders, well, it actually really depends on uh, which uh, hardware platform we are considering, which uh, system on a chip we are talking about. Well, because some um, actually allow all the bootloaders to be free, uh, because usually there are more than uh, one bootloader. There are usually two, maybe sometimes three. Some are free, some are not. For instance, on uh, Samsung Exynos or MediaTek or Snapdragon, the uh, primary bootloader is always non-free. But there are also good platforms such as uh, the Arduino platform or the uh, Texas Instruments OMAP platform which uh, make it possible to run uh, free uh, bootloaders. However, we can have uh, serious issues with uh, signatures. Well, sometimes the uh, bootloaders can have a numeric signature which is checked against by uh, either the previous stage bootloader or the uh, very first initialization code that is in the SOC, in the system on a chip. So uh, if the signature doesn't match the uh, private key that is stored uh, on the device and that is read-only, uh, the uh, system will refuse to start. So that's very very problematic because if we were to um, to develop a free bootloader for uh, one platform, uh, we couldn't sign it with the manufacturer's private key because it is secret. Hence, if we were to install the free software replacement on the device, even if the code was right to make it boot, well, it just would not happen because the uh, check on the signature would not match the uh, manufacturer's private key and it would refuse to boot. And ironically sometimes we do have the source code for uh, one bootloader but we know that it is signed so if we rebuild that source code and install it on the device well uh, it will break the device and it won't work at all. So that's a very very serious issue. So not all the platforms um, uh, ship with uh, signatures enabled. Uh, it really depends on uh, how the um, 
the chip is set and sometimes it's possible to disable the check by tweaking uh, resistors or things like that on the board but it's never easy and actually the only platform that is known to uh, not use signatures is uh, all winner which is why it's a good target for uh, freedom okay now let's talk about the uh, free systems well there are plenty of uh, so-called free systems or open systems out there uh, some are very recent, for instance Firefox OS, Ubuntu Touch or Tizen are really uh, quite recent. Well, there are also other examples of uh, free systems. If we look at it, uh, the kernel is uh, usually the Linux kernel. It's mostly free software. Sometimes um, there can be proprietary models, but that's kind of rare. Doesn't really happen uh, a lot these days. So the kernel is usually free software. Then uh, on the very top of the system, the applications can be free. Not uh, not every application is free, but it's rather easy to go with uh, only free applications. And then the framework is also usually free software, but real trouble begins when we're talking about the hardware abstraction libraries, which is software in charge of talking with the hardware and communicating with it. So these uh, libraries are very often proprietary. If we take a step back and uh, look at the current situation, well, obviously we have locked hardware because we're not yet able to produce our own hardware at home. Uh, actually, uh, the um, the companies manufacturing chips really uh, use uh, machines that cost a lot of money. Well, 3D printers are perhaps opening uh, the way of a new era where one would be able to produce uh, their own circuits just uh, with a simple machine, but we're not there yet. Farm was running inside the uh, integrated circuits. Well, they are for the most uh, proprietary, even though some examples of free farmers exist. They're really not common. Regarding the modem, well, the, the system is... Uh, is proprietary for all the uh, devices we're talking about. The modem system is always proprietary because um, Osmoc on BB doesn't run on uh, any of these. But uh, we can have modem isolation if we're very careful about uh, how the chips are built in together. So uh, that's something possible and uh, actually a few devices are known to have uh, good modem isolation. Even though we cannot completely be certain of modem isolation because we cannot know whether the schematics match the actual uh, board because we cannot recreate the board from the schematics so we have to trust the manufacturer we have to trust that the schematics we're looking at are actually uh, what's on the board but if we make that assumption then there are a few targets out there which are known to have good modem isolation um, for the bootloaders, uh, it's it's also possible to choose platforms that uh, that use uh, free bootloaders and that don't have the signature problem. That's an issue that can be resolved by choosing the right platforms. Now, a free system. Well, apparently there are a, uh, a variety of uh, different uh, systems. However, we we saw that. Well, the uh, hardware abstraction libraries are usually proprietary, so. Do we really have a free system? Well, that's what we're going to talk about next. So, um, to draw a bottom line, well, if you really care about freedom and security, and if you really want to make no compromise, or if uh, anything serious is, is at stake, for instance, if you're a, a journalist, or if you're living in a uh, country where you know that the government is not going to respect your freedom, well, then uh, don't use any uh, telephony-enabled device because uh, it's compromised and you won't um, you won't achieve real freedom and security with that. Well, else if you're not in one of these uh, situations, uh, it means that you can uh, make compromises and uh, you can try and uh, have the the freest platform out there, but it's never going to be complete as of today. Okay, so um, now we're taking a closer look at free systems. The the situation um, back in the days, back in 2008, 
was uh, the following. So it was at the uh, early days of uh, freedom on um, mobile devices. So what we had was the open moco. It was a, a, a phone with free hardware design. Um, it means that we had the schematics for the board, not for the uh, components internals, but for the way they were arranged and uh, and uh, put together. From the schematics, we knew that it had a uh, an isolated modem, uh, which meant that the modem could not access the CPU, nor the RAM, nor the storage, nor anything else it shouldn't have access to. Was It was pretty good for security and privacy. It also had a free bootloader and uh, could run fully free GNU Linux systems, and uh, namely, it was running Debian. These were very uh, standard GNU Linux operating systems that were used on computers at the time because, uh, well, there was no um, mobile specific uh, operating system. However, um, still in 2008, uh, Android uh, appeared with the uh, HTC Dream, the uh, first Google phone, so the Google G1, which was also called the AGP1, so that's all the same device. Well, it wasn't so great because it had a proprietary bootloader. Um, it had an unisolated modem. Well, at the time we didn't know, but now we're pretty sure that um, modem isolation in that uh, particular device is very bad. Um, I recall the modem can access uh, the the storage, the, the random access memory, uh, as well as perhaps the camera and uh, the microphone so it's a very bad device for privacy however it was the first device to uh, run Android and uh, well a free system apparently could be achieved with uh, the Android open source project which um, which had all of its uh, source code released at android.git.kernel.org uh, the address changed, but that's where it all started. It uh, was soon discovered that the phone couldn't run with AOSP. Uh, it needed um, some hardware abstraction libraries. So uh, a couple of uh, enthusiasts gathered up and thought, well, we have uh, a nearly free system, which is uh, Android AOSP. And well, perhaps we could uh, push it a little further and try to have a completely uh, a completely free system. So uh, that was the goal, and that's what uh, what became Replicant. So that's how Replicant was born. So if we look at it now, um, Android is more of a family of operating systems more than uh, just one system in particular. So uh, at first we have um, the Android version that is developed internally by Google. So um, as long as Google doesn't release the source code for it, it uh, remains proprietary. And that's something that happened for uh, with the uh, Android version 3. Uh, Google did not release the source code while devices were built with uh, Android 3. So uh, that particular version of Android remained proprietary. Now that version of uh, Android, Google's internal version, can be accessed by uh, the big uh, OEM, the big uh, phone and de devices manufacturers. So uh, they can take that source code and uh, build their own version of, of it. They add uh, their own share of uh, changes or their own interface. And usually they uh, they don't release uh, the modifications for these uh, changes, so uh, the version can also be seen as proprietary. However, um, when Google does release the source code for Android, that goes through the um, Android Open Source Project, so AOSP. Uh, that version of Android can be seen as uh, fully free or nearly fully free, because I recall there are a few proprietary bits included, but really uh, a very, very small number. So uh, it's not really exactly fully free, but it's really close. Then from uh, AOSP, uh, there are a lot of community Android versions, such as Cyanogen Mod, Omni, and uh, a lot of others. Well, these uh, these versions take the AOSP source code and uh, add their own improvements, their own modifications, and new features and all that. 
and they also try to run on a wide range of devices so usually uh, any any android device out there and uh, then you finally have uh, replicant which is based off cyanogen mod usually i describe replicant as a fully free version of android running on several devices the fact that it's running on several devices is very relevant because aosp doesn't run on devices Actually, the devices it has support for are the Nexus devices by Google and it has incomplete support for them because uh, it doesn't include all the uh, proprietary parts that are needed to um, to have the hardware working properly. So these are the um, hardware abstraction libraries. They're not part of AOSP, which is why I call AOSP a uh, nearly fully free uh, system. It actually doesn't run without them. If you try to build AOSP and install it on a Nexus device, uh, it won't, it won't run at all. It will crash and it won't, you won't even go to the home screen. So, um, the other community Android versions, such as Cyanogen Mod or Omni, well, they all have the proprietary libraries, the, uh, hardware abstraction libraries, they, uh, include them. And, uh, they do for a very wide range of devices because they don't only support the Nexus devices, they also support a lot of different manufacturers. And for each of these devices, uh, a lot of proprietary, um, uh, hardware abstraction libraries need to be included for the device to work properly. Then you also have the uh, firmwares, so uh, the, the software running inside uh, other chips, inside integrated circuits. Sometimes the firmwares have to be loaded by the operating system. In order for these files to be uh, loaded, well, they have to be distributed with the system, which is why these uh, community Android versions um just uh, bundle these firmwares with their uh with their system uh sometimes you can also find uh proprietary applications on top of uh what's uh, based on AOSP for instance a very popular uh, android version is uh, my ui that particular version includes a lot of proprietary applications on top some community android versions also uh encourage the use of uh, Google's proprietary applications, such as the Google uh, Google Play Store, the Google Maps, YouTube, and all that. Very often, all these community Android versions uh, include malicious features. They're not always intended to be malicious, but they very often behave like malicious features. For instance, in most of these, uh, when you type uh, anything on the web browser, uh, it sends anything you're typing on uh, on the uh, URL field, it sends that to Google because it does an automatic Google search. So that's a malicious feature that is included in most of uh, the community Android versions. Now looking at Replicant, well, uh, Replicant is uh, based upon Cyanogen mods, so it, uh, it inherits all the improvements that were made, for instance, to the interface. But the uh, proprietary libraries are replaced or avoided. Avoided means that we just uh, don't include them in the system and, well, any feature that relies on it will just not work. Same goes for uh, proprietary farmers, except that we don't really try to replace them. We just get them out and we uh, don't distribute them with the system. We also try to remove the malicious features, uh, such as the uh, URL field keylogger on the browser. We, uh, we, we remove that on Replicant. And we also ship with the uh, FDA. It's, uh, it's an equivalent to the Google Play Store, but it only shows uh, free software applications that uh, you can install and that all respect your freedom. So Replicant really aims to be usable on actual devices. It's not just a, a concept, not just an idea. We we didn't just take a uh, community Android version, sign again mod. We did not just uh, remove the proprietary ports out and just install it on the device, regardless of whether the device remains useful or not. We really want to uh, have something usable, not just uh, something uh, theoretical. 
So most of the work to have something that actually works is uh, replacing the proprietary components because uh, these components are very often uh, related to important basic features of the device such as audio. Well, if you don't have audio on the device, it's going to be very difficult to uh, use that telephony function. You're not going to be able to make calls. You're not going to be able to uh, listen to music and all that. So um, we really need uh, that working. So if it's proprietary, well, we're going to try very hard to replace it with free software. So we really have uh, a lot of uh, software to write. And very often we have uh, very little documentation about how the hardware works. And really, uh, we do that for various aspects of the device. So um, audio is one very important thing we, uh, we work on, but also camera, uh, the modem, uh, because there is a port that communicates with the modem on the uh, operating system, and we need that port to be free even though the port that is running on the uh, modem is proprietary. Uh, however, there are some uh, very complex tasks that we just don't deal with. Uh, that's the case with firmwares because uh, it's very hard to uh, to replace firmwares and we're, not, we're just not skilled to do it. And we also uh, don't deal with uh, graphics acceleration in 3D because that's really a big piece of work and, uh, well, we, we really can't uh, focus on that. Other free software projects are actually working on uh, graphics acceleration in 3D. Uh, for the Mali GPUs, you have the Lima project. So yeah, most of the work that we do is really um, understanding the proprietary components, uh, writing free software replacements. So uh, basically when we understood how uh, a proprietary uh, component works, what it does, how it works, well, we, uh, we get these ideas and we uh, implement them in uh, a new software that we start usually from scratch. Uh, a new implementation that aims to replace the uh, non-free one. We are also working with uh, other communities. Uh, we are including uh, their replacements in Replicant because um, other projects are also uh, working on replacing uh, non-free components. Not really always for the same reasons, but they end up doing it too. Uh, these other projects are also integrating Replicant's work. Uh, for instance, in CyanogenMod uh, and OmniRom2. So we, uh, we do that, we write these replacements because uh, it's better for freedom. But other projects do it because they want these replacements to be uh, technically better, to work better to have more features, all that, because, well, if you look at it, um, in proprietary software, you cannot add more features. And it's also very, uh, very important for them uh, to uh, port uh, devices to new versions of Android. It means that usually when you, when you have a uh, binary-only uh, non-free software for um, a particular function of uh, the device, for instance, uh, for the camera, you want to uh, to move to the next version of Android. Well, if the um, the camera API, the camera interface uh, changed, then you cannot use the uh, non-free uh, software, the non-free library. You cannot use it on the new version because the interface won't match. So if you're interested in uh, learning more about Replicant, we have a website, uh, a wiki, as well as the uh, bug tracker. And you can get in touch with us um, through our forums, or our mailing list, but also we have uh, an IRC channel, which is uh, Replicant at Freenad. So in short terms, Replicant looks just like the Android open source project or Cyanogen mod. It is exclusively made of free software and avoid the proprietary ports. This is why some features are not available on Replicant, such as GPS localization or graphics acceleration in 3D. However, the Replicant supported devices work well enough for daily use and provide at least the very basic telephony features. 
Um, the list of uh, current replicant supported devices and their status is available on our wiki, redmine.replicant.us, as well as installation guides for each device and instructions to build the replicant source code. You are also welcome to take part in our community through our forums at redmine.replicant.us, our mailing list, or our IRT channel, uh, Replicant at Freenard. But as Replicant is currently a one-man effort, we're always looking for new developers. Our wiki provides information on how to get involved in the project, how to build the Replicant source code, and how to start a port of Replicant to a new device. The uh, requirements to start hacking on Replicant are, well, knowledge of the C programming language, of make files, and of the uh, Git uh, version control software. While some of uh, the tasks may require uh, advanced low-level knowledge, I believe Replicant is a great occasion to uh, learn about these things. And as a matter of fact, uh, I began developing on Replicant when I was 15 years old, and at the time uh, I didn't know C very well and never had dealt with Git. Uh, getting involved in the project really made me learn a lot. So um, any contribution is welcome and we'll try as much as possible to help newcomers get started. Alright, so that's it for this presentation. Uh, thanks for your time and for your interest towards mobile freedom.